Western Ave as we know it today started in 2004 when Carl Fry, who's the owner, bought this whole com complex, the campus, this building, the mills, everything um, from a company called Collins and Aikman. And he originally thought maybe he would do condos here, couldn't do that, and was trying to find tenants for some vacant space in the building. And the city suggested that maybe some artist studios would be a good idea since there were, at that time, in 2004, there were 13 studios in Lowell. Now, that was 2005, 2019, at Western Ave alone, there are 245 studios and 50 live workspaces. You're in my live work loft. So it's been this transition from being a working textile mill, and this used to be the dye house, to being all artists working in every medium you can think of and rather enjoying it. We came to, um, to Lowell, we moved to Lowell because of Western Avenue. We first started looking for, um, well, I, I particularly wanted to move back up north. I went to art school in New York City and I kind of missed the seasons and the architecture and all the museums that are available on this side of the United States. And um, when we found out the Western Avenue artist community, it was very attractive. We started looking into the different uh, possibilities for studios and loft spaces like the one here. And we were hooked. That's how we ended up here. It's been a wonderful experience. There's so many different artists from different um, uh, avenues. Uh, we got writers and dancers and musicians and visual artists, uh, performers, and we've been embraced. It's, a, it's been a wonderful, wonderful experience. Being a sculptor, I work in pretty heavy, um, dusty, noisy type materials. Um, I used to have a studio in my basement back many years ago. And uh, of course, the low ceilings, not much light. Um, it's a pain to carry the marble downstairs into the basement, pain to carry it back up. Um, my first studio after that was fifth floor um, and I really like these high studios. I was also had a studio on the corner of Rock and Willie Street prior to this. Um, it was actually the only artist studio in the building. It was all businesses and I uh, heard about Western Avenue opening up. Um, seemed like a really good option to actually be part of a artist community. Um, so when I came here it was just maybe a handful of us, maybe 25 of us that were interested and it was just this top floor that was available as studios and we actually got, got to pick out what spaces we wanted with spray paint on the floor and uh, then we had the walls put up and uh, it was really nice to have a place where i could get dirty dusty noisy and not have to worry about the you know marble dust in the kitchen or anything like that so we've been in western avenue for five years we actually came from miami and um this is the first time that I've lived in, in the Northeast. I think that the facilities, the spaces are very conducive to uh, working in art. The, you know, both in the, in the size of the spaces, the lighting, and the community is, is really important. It's very supportive. Uh, I, I'm able to collaborate with a lot of people, particularly using different kilns for my ceramics. Um, uh, the first three years I was in the studio side and the last two years I've been, I moved over to the loft. So I still have a studio across the way, but I predominantly do the paintings in this space. And uh, I'd say overall, it's, it's allowed me to really explode and work at a much larger scale and at a larger volume. I got a studio with a bunch of friends and we brought chairs. They outlined our studio. We put our chairs down. It was like, okay, this is ours. Because we had no place to get together, no place to work. And that's what has continued to bring people here. I mean, there are 245 studios and they're full because there's just no place like it. It is also a lot cheaper. There are studio buildings in Waltham, 
down in Boston, but people pay four and five times what we pay to be there. And in terms of the live workspace, in terms of the lofts, there are virtually, there aren't many live workspaces for rent um, in Massachusetts. Living and working at Western Ave has been a huge boost uh, for not only my artwork, the quality of my artwork, but also how I go about doing it and all of the um, contacts, all of the con new connections that have come out of being here have just opened my eyes to all sorts of things that I never experienced before in an artist community and in doing the work itself. Um, so it's been a, a huge gift for me. I can't uh, exaggerate too much how Western Ave and the people here have helped me as a person in my in the in the growth of my career really so it's been awesome just strictly awesome I was fortunate enough to be born in a household filled with uh, very creative individuals. My grandmother was an artist, my grandfather was a writer and an artist, a painter. My mother was uh, is a dancer, had a, her own dance studio. She also designed her own, her own costumes for her uh, presentations. Uh, I was a dancer myself, so art was always around me and it seemed like it was the natural thing to do. I was an only child. So it was my best companion. I do not recall one particular moment where, where I took a pencil and started. I just think it was always there. I think when I was when I was a kid, I built a lot of car models. Um, I used to, you know, necessarily not necessarily have them be the same car and the same model. I might take different pieces from different cars and kind of hot rod them. Um, then I started playing with clay, making things. There's a point where I wanted to design cars. Uh, another point where I wanted to do graphic design and I actually started to go to school for graphic design and uh, discovered sculpture as uh, my true love. Um, not necessarily as profitable as graphic design, but um, this was also back when all the lettering that you saw was hand lettered, you know, it wasn't computerized. This was some time ago. And uh, now with sculpture, I'm still very much a traditionalist. Um, but you've got people that are doing the 3D printers, designing things on computers. Um, everything progresses, but I'm definitely an old timer. You know, I never really thought I was going to be an artist. When I was growing up, you know, back when dinosaurs roamed, um, creativity was not something that you pursued, you know? My parents felt that I, you know, when I was in high school, that I should take secretor secret blah, secretarial courses and just work as a secretary until I could get married and have kids. And I didn't think that was such a great idea. And I started quilting. And for about 10 years, I made bed quilts and I made art quilts. And then I started taking art classes because I needed to paint my own fabric. I needed to dye my own fabric. I needed to learn about color. And gradually I started doing so much in the way of, of painting and printmaking that I stopped making quilts and started making art. So it was never like a conscious decision on my part. I'm going to be an artist but I kind of evolved organically as an artist. And that's what I do. I must have been probably, you know, three years old. I don't really remember the first um, painting that I did. Um, my uncle was a professor at a art school. So I always had the materials and I always had the ability to see what he was doing. I remember a lot of my really early stuff was nature oriented. And I do remember doing things like uh, whales with like headdresses, like feathers on, throughout their backs and really weird. So it was always somewhat surreal. Uh, when I was a, uh, a kid, uh, of course I was outdoors all the time and loved nature and everything. And my mother was a bit of a painter. 
So I watched her create artwork and I naturally started doing it myself and my parents encouraged it. And as I got older, I just continued to do it in different ways. And um, it was one of those things that uh, just stuck with me, I guess you could say. And I just lo loved um, making my own stuff. And then I started to learn about art and artists through going to the museum, reading art books and that kind of thing. So that just kept me going. I would consider myself a mixture between a surrealist and, um, uh, or maybe magic realism with surrealism. It's kind of like, they're both very similar in many ways. Surrealism has to do with your subconscious mind, your dreams. Uh, magic realism has to do with the everyday life in a very fantastic way. So I think there's a fusion between those two styles. I also um, use a technique called automatism, which was born during the surrealist period. Um, and it has to do with allowing your subconscious to come forward. So you're not really thinking about anything in particular and your subconscious kind of speaks at some point. Uh, the beginning of my painting started that way. And then after I realized what they are, then it becomes a dialogue between the painting and, and myself. My fine art is the stone carvings. These are, are marble. Um, this one is a piece of Vermont marble um, called the Seed of Creativity. Um, I work anywhere from small like this up to like 300 pound pieces of marble. Um, biggest pieces I've worked on are granite. Um, it was almost 10 tons of granite. Um, so that's my, my fine art. Um, I make the small plaster gargoyles um, the originals I make in clay and then make molds from those and cast them in plaster and cement. Most are plaster um, and then I paint them to look like various materials um, inspired by mythology. Um, sometimes I make my, up my own mythology figuring the old myths started somewhere. Might as well make some new myths. Um, and then recently I started building machines for the Lowell Kinetic Sculpture Race, which are um, kind of science, technology, engineering, art and math all combined into one. These are machines that are human powered, um, pedal powered in my case, um, to go through land, mud and water for the little kinetic sculpture race. I'm very much a process artist. I love the act of making the art. Um, it's not necessarily a vision of the end result of how it's going to be because a lot of that time it's kind of a creative path. Um, I might have a, a rough idea of how the piece is going to finish, but I definitely am open to um, kind of a dialogue, particularly with the stone. Um, as things evolve, I like to react to different things that I see going on. Um, things like the kinetic sculpture race, you know, it's a, from the start, I have a basic idea, but as I'm working on the piece, ideas come along, um, supplies, you know, since a lot of it is made with found objects, recycled objects, um, you know, you're thinking of what am I going to use float for flotation? Oh, there's that thing that could be kind of cool. How do I integrate that into my design, um, figuring out the, the gear ratios to be able to get through the mud and be able to climb up out of the water onto the beach. Um, that's not really the art aspect of things. That's the engineering and, yeah. and all. Um, with, the, with the gargoyles, I like to be able to make something that's timeless, um, but also contemporary. Um, obviously something like the coffee house Chester is, uh, is a new gargoyle. Um, and maybe I'll make a tea sipping Chester one of these days that's contemporary. But the, the, um, the gargoyles, I liked that they, they appear to be old, um, you know, something like, this is a new piece, cinder. You know, um, dragons are timeless. That's just a new dragon. Right now I'm doing collage and I am working on creating a form of collage that looks at the urban landscape, the way a, an historical geographer, which I was trained as, would look at the landscape. Because when you look at a, a city, you, as a geographer, you look at its history, you look at its architecture, you look at 
how the buildings all mesh. You look at the topography that was there. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do now. I would say that my work is a combination of surrealism with some classical elements. And predominantly, it definitely has a Latin America uh, influence, uh, particularly it's very psychological and uh, there's a lot of uh, deep uh, content that I'm exploring through the figures that I'm creating, uh, predominantly dealing with events that are happening around the world uh, presently with climate change and different social injustices. Well, personally, um, I'm sort of like the plain Jane uh, kind of painting where uh, it's supposed to be a scene of something that you can recognize and or a person or some animal whatever it is however it's done it's done in a way that oh that's a you know that's a that's a bird flying over that uh, tree or um, you know that's a portrait of so-and-so and that's the ocean there and I can recognize so I like it to look like what it's supposed to look like so that you can recognize it but then I like to um, add another element that's kind of like the unseen thing that I create entirely with my imagination and I'll put that in the scene and that's sort of like um, I don't know, representing kind of like the spiritual part or maybe some religious aspect, but maybe it's done in a way that's kind of abstract. Like if you look up there at that painting on the wall, it's got an ocean, right? And you can recognize it's an ocean. It looks like an ocean going off in the distance. But then those figures that are on there, where do you see that? I usually start my underpainting with uh, acrylic just because it dries faster. I also use a lot of charcoal with water. I like the way that it uh, it dries, allowing chance to kind of come in and do its thing, part of my automatism process. So I would say my, uh, my materials are charcoal, acrylic as my underpainting, and then I begin the entire process with um, that process after the underpainting with oils. Okay, for the, for the gargoyles, I use um, a lot of hand tools, clay tools like you'd use if you were doing ceramics. Um, uh, once I have the clay pretty much how I like it, I'll make a waste mold, which is mixing up plaster, splash it on the clay. Once that's hardened, I take it off the clay, clean it, fill that with, with plaster, and I'm left with a, a plaster copy of the clay. Then I'll go in and use fine tooth chisels to create um, some of the textures I'll carve the name into the piece using a, a small chisels, and then I'll make a rubber mold from those to reproduce them over and over again. Favorite piece of work probably varies from day to day. Um, the uh, it kind of depends on my mood. You know, some mornings when I get up, I feel kind of like uh, Medusa. Other times, I feel more like a uh, you know, guardian of hopes and dreams. Um, and I love the, the creativity and working with the marble. Um, you know, it's, it's almost not even a piece, but elements of pieces that become favorites. Um, with the iconic flying fish, I loved the making the fish that flies over the shark made out of cat food can covers. It was uh, something that I didn't plan on making for the machine, but as things went along, I was like, oh, this would be kind of fun. I usually start with charcoal. A lot of my underpainting is charcoal based. Um, so it starts with very loose sketches uh, directly onto the canvas. And after that, I start uh, applying the oil paints. And recently, 
I've been dealing with additional other materials like the, uh, the painting behind me, it looks like rust, it actually is rust. So I've been applying metal oxides directly into the canvas and um, oxidizing them with different acid solutions. For my sculptures, I uh, predominantly I use ceramics, but recently I've been doing much more uh, bronze sculptures as well as I'm beginning to experiment with uh, resins and uh, epoxy compounds that essentially allow me to bring color and a little more modernity into my work. I use every conceivable tool that you can imagine. Um, beyond the normal paint brushes, I use all kinds of painting knives, rollers. Um, I use uh, spray guns. I use printing techniques. Um, I use techniques where I uh, destroy part of the surface. Um, and in terms of how I get to the image, how I get it on the, the painting surface, I use all kinds of different um, technological tools. I believe uh, part of the job of an artist is to stay uh, in tune with what is uh, happening. You have to stay fresh. So I'm always looking at contemporary art, at new artists, um, at, uh, well, one of my time favorites is uh, David Mansour. He's an artist from Colombia. Um, but I would say, I mean, if I list the names, it would just be endless. So I'm always looking at art. I'm fortunate that I've got the, the stone carving that is inspired by classical statuary. Um, geometry, organic materials, and the stone itself. I just love carving marble. Um, with the gargoyles and so forth, um, architectural ornament inspires me, nature, um, animals. Obviously, I love animals. This is our little new puppy, Luna, or Esther, currently named. Um, but I, I love nature, plants, um, you know, organic things. Lowell is very unique. I mean, I grew up in Chicago. I went to college in Denver and in back, in, I did grad school outside of Chicago and then I came to Boston to get a PhD. And there's something about Lowell. Lowell is, I don't know what it is. It's like the vibe is amazing. I know so many people who grew up in Lowell, who moved away and who've come back because there's something about this place that is exciting. It's visually stimulating. The, the enormous variety of cultures here is incredible the diversity. So that's where I go draw my inspiration is the city of Lowell. So yeah, it's the, the Lowell, definitely my inspiration. And the people, the people of Lowell, the people of Lowell are amazing. What's going on today in the world and what we're doing to the planet plays a big role in the type of art that I do, as well as, you know, artistic influences, both like primitive art from Neolithic periods, as well as classical figurative, you know, representations of sculptures. I'm always, I'm always looking at uh, contemporary artists that are around today. I wouldn't necessarily say that I have a school that I follow or that I pay tribute to anyone, but definitely looking at sculptors like Javier Marin, who's a contemporary Mexican sculptor, who's really pushing the bounds of kind of like reinterpreting classical art with modern materials and at really large scales is somebody that I closely follow.
it's really nice to be part of this community. Um, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll go to my studio, close the door and just focus on my work. But other times if I wanted to be more social and talk about art, see what other people are doing, I just have to walk down the hall and poke my head into someone's studio and we can chat, and have a cup of coffee, talk about things. It's really nice. And then having open studios once a month, getting people to come in, having, you know, the spectators, the art um, appreciators to come in. It's really nice to have that dialogue. Um, you, know, you can't survive as an artist in a in a void. You've got, yeah. to, you've got to talk to people, and um, I enjoy that. It's my home. It's where I work. It's my community. It makes you feel connected. It makes you feel whole. And if something happens to you, you know that there are people who will come and help you. Um, what is it? Four years ago, I had a heart attack. And people came to visit me in the hospital. They brought me home. They brought me meals after I got out of the hospital. And that's something that you don't find in a lot of places. I mean, outside of your own family. So we have this giant extended family that watches out for each other. And that's, I mean, I love it. In terms of how do I feel about this place? It's the best thing that ever happened to me. It's, it's my world at this point. That's what it is.